Uh, what do you think, Kevin? You like my uh, vintage gauge collection? This is some of it anyway. Uh, hi, divers. Alec Pierce, scuba. And uh, this is a vintage scuba listing, playlist. I get these all, Kevin, you have to help me here. Am I doing tech tips? Vinci Scuba or Sea it's getting complicated. And you said you want to open a sell another one. No, not going to happen. I'm having enough trouble already. Anyway, I know this is Vinci Scuba because I'm looking at a bunch of gauges, and now one of these gauges is newer than 40 years. Some of them are almost 50 or 60 years old. You see, when we first started scuba diving, I started diving in 58, I did have a, a, a wrist gauge. As a matter of fact, I had this wrist gauge right here, made by Taylor, same company that uh, that still makes instruments today. We'll come to that in just a moment. That was my uh, gauge. I had one for uh, a compass and one for depth. Uh, but that was it. We didn't have a submersible pressure gauge. Uh, there were no submersible pressure gauges. We didn't have very many depth gauges. First of all, the depth gauges weren't very good. And uh, secondly, they were expensive. And I was on a real budget. I paid $75 for my entire tank, scuba unit, wetsuit, regulator, the whole darn thing. And that broke me. I was only making uh, 25 cents an hour uh, uh, peeling potatoes and unfolding newspapers for the local fish and chip store. Did that for ages and ages. But uh, anyway, I was going to be a frogman. It didn't matter come uh, heck or high water. I guess high water is good. But anyway, I was going to be just like Mike Nelson. I determined, so I saved up every penny I had, and I managed to get a scuba unit. The gauges, a lot of divers didn't dive with gauges, you know. First of all, we had a J-valve on the regular, so we didn't have to have a pressure gauge. That was not a real big deal back then. We didn't dive very deep. Uh, secondly, uh, we had a good idea how deep the water was. We just put the anchor down. We measured it. Uh, thirdly, uh, dive tables. We knew about dive tables. We knew about decompression sickness. We weren't, we weren't stupid, okay? I'm not trying to say we were stupid. We knew about embolism. We knew about decompression sickness, and we knew about Martini's Law. Not just your narcosis, right? Every 50 feet, you could do a martini, one martini and a dry stomach. You, you've heard that. We'll talk about that some other time. So we knew about that stuff. We just didn't have much in the way of theory, and we didn't have any instrumentation in those old days. So knowing that, that you could only stay for 20 minutes at 100 feet, was we knew that. Couldn't measure 100 feet. I couldn't measure time underwater. So the whole thing was kind of academic. We went diving. And in those days, we had a rule of thumb. We had a lot of rules of thumb. They didn't work, but they made us feel good, and I'm still here. One rule of thumb was that you cannot get decompression sickness while using a single 72 cubic foot tank. And that's what we used. That's what we all had. That's what we had. So we fill up our tank. We go diving. Didn't matter how deep or how long, because you'd be out of air before you could get sick. I know. I know. I know. Don't give me a hard time. I'm still here. We didn't know any better. Instrumentation came along. It started to develop. Some was coming around in the 50s, but very few, and they were expensive, usually made in Europe, and, and not, not, not all that accurate anyway, so we shied away from them. Through the 60s, more and more gauges became, uh, became available, and the prices started to drop as diving start, became more popular. And then we started into the 70s, and finally in the 70s, we started to have real gauges, actually consoles, in fact. Some guy was smart, and he put all of his gauges on a piece of plywood, some companies saw that, and they started making plastic ones, and on it went. I can explain the whole development of gauges, all the way from a depth gauge that uses a tube of water to let you know how deep you are. Yeah, capillary tubes. I have a whole bunch of them here. Right up to today's modern computers. I, and I know the whole process, all the way, everything about them. So I can share some of that with you. But let me just show you today, in this episode, I'm going to try to keep it short. I'm going to show you some of the old gauges, some that are pretty weird, some that work really well, some are, that are commonplace, some are quite valuable. And, um, and then in later vintage scuba episodes, I'll maybe pick depth gauges or compasses and share that with you. But let's take a look at these. Okay, so the very, very earliest gauges were the depth gauges, because it was an important thing to be able to measure your depth. And people knew, physicists, physicists told us that if you had a tube of water, like a glass of water, the tube of water, full of air, sealed at the top, and full of air at the surface, and you started to take it down into the water, so the water, because of the pressure, the water would start to climb up into the tube. And they knew, in fact, that if you had a two-foot tube of air, and you took it to 30 feet, 33 feet, let's just say 30 feet, that the water would be halfway up. Right? Because the air is compressed to one half. So the water would come up halfway. The air left on the tube would be one half of its original size. You, see? you took it down to 66 feet, it would come up another third, roughly. Take it down to 100 feet, and you're up to one quarter of the original size. You see? So we could, we could use that as a gauge. Now, we're not going to carry a glass tube around, so they took a tube and they bent it a few times, wrapped it around a little dial, and 
put it on our wrist. Here is one of the very, very earliest, and by the way, one of the most valuable depth gauges available today. This was actually in, in the catalog, U.S. divers catalogs in the 50s. And this one is in absolutely perfect condition. And you take a close look at it, you'll see that there actually is a tube inside. It's coiled a couple of times. You can see the zero, and you can see the 30 feet, and you can see the 60, the 100, and everything else. And this is just plastic, not very good plastic. This is early, early plastic. It was very brittle. And this whole thing was supposed to be held on with elastic bands, which is still in really good shape. This little device I have in my hand probably sold for about $15, and I suspect that uh, vintage scuba divers might pay as much as $150 or $200 for it, maybe more in perfect condition like this, okay? So that was a very, very early one. Now here's another sample, same thing, same company, U.S. Divers, big company at the time. And this one was called, I'm gonna get Kevin to look at this, you see what, can you see that, Kevin? What it's called? Bathometer. Bathometer. We didn't even know it was a depth gauge. It was called a bathometer, which basically means pressure, pressure meter. And you know what a depth gauge really is a pressure meter. I think you understand that. It's not measuring depth. It's measuring pressure. And then they just change it instead of pressure, they show feet. So this is the same thing. It's called a capillary gauge. This tube is now circular. So it starts at zero and 30 and on it goes all the way around. This one's actually in meters, but uh, you can see that this is a bathometer. U.S. divers, Aqualong, made in France. Very, very early as well. And then they got more and more sophisticated, but most companies had, uh, had uh, capillary gauges. Here's a Decor capillary gauge. Here's a Scuba Pro capillary gauge. Later models, a little fancier, a little more color. There's a later U.S. divers capillary gauges and so on, you see. And they're just basically tubes. As a matter of fact, what we used to have to do because they would sometimes get salt and sand in them. So you had to clean them once in a while. So just to demonstrate exactly how these worked, how simple they were, every once in a while you would have to take the tube out. So you'd just take something sharp like this, and you thought I was kidding, that's a tube? It's just a piece of aquarium tubing. That's all it is. That's all it is. You see that? And one end is plugged, one end is open, and they got a flat dial with some numbers on it. And so you clean this out, maybe take the plug out, if you have to, clean it out with some fresh water and make sure there's nothing in it, and then you put it back together. All you have to do is make sure that the open end lines up with the zero. Put the open end right at the zero, right there, and squeeze it back in, and okay, let's go diving. Just that easy. The downside, the computer gauges were great. I mean, they were simple. They can't break, right? They were simple, but the difficulty is that since the increase in the pressure is not directly proportional, it changes, then what happens is here's zero, here is 30 feet. That's halfway around. Oh, we just said that, didn't we? Halfway. From zero to 30, the pressure doubles. The volume of the air remaining in the tube is one half. So zero to 30. So between zero and 30 feet, it was very accurate. See, I can look on here and I can find nine feet. You have trouble finding nine feet on a modern gauge. But on a computer gauge, it's very easy. So zero to 30. Now here's the problem. 60 is over here. You see? 100 is right there. Well, you, I can point out 9 feet, but I can't show 50 feet. I can't show 54 feet. I can't show 72 because the numbers, as, as the water gets, the, the numbers get closer and closer and closer and closer together. So eventually, by the time you get to 100, between 150 and 200, just a fraction of an inch would be better. That's the downside. They're really, really accurate, simple, cheap, easy to clean, and everything else. Good for shallow water. Well, that was great when we were vintage divers. In fact, these were so popular, so accurate, people loved them so much that when finally we got pressure gauges, real gauges with needles in them. See that? A needle in it as you moved around like your pressure, like your depth gauges today. De just like today. Can you see that one, Kev? I'm going to hold it still for a minute because <clears throat> there you go. There's a modern depth gauge. See the needle? Zero, the dapa do. You see that? But what's that around the outside? Around the outside. That's the capillary gauge. Sure, he went into the dive store, and the dive store said, look, I got these brand new analog gauges with needles, much easier to read, and they're good and accurate in the deep water. I said, well, yeah, I don't mind getting one of those. I got a bit of extra money, but I don't want to give up my capillary gauge. So the guy said, all right, we'll put a capillary gauge on it. Can't go wrong. Kind of like divers today 
who buy a computer, but they want to keep their depth gauge. Yeah, it's sort of the same idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of neat, huh? And there were lots of them like that. The U.S. divers, capillary gauge, wrap around, and so on. Lots of them. But eventually, divers realized that the, the dial gauges were excellent. So here's a whole bunch of just ordinary depth gauges, dial gauges, different colors. Scuba Pro. Scuba Pro, of course, is a little bit bigger, a little flashier, and so on. Small ones, big ones, held the waist, Voight. And, oh, I, I can't, you know, all different makes. Oh, there's a Voight. And uh, there's one, a great big magnifying lens on the front. It looks weird when you're on the surface, you, can't hardly, you can hardly read it, but underwater it's great. <laughs> it looks like it's about four inches around, the magnifying lens. These ones are kind of weird. Look at this one here. This one, <clears throat> this is pretty neat. This is a Navy gauge, and, uh, and uh, it's called the Navy gauge, and it's kind of weird. You can see right now that the arrow is pointing at zero. But this is a bit weird because the arrow doesn't move. The dial underneath moves. So as you go deeper, the dial moves. So it's zero, and then 20, and then 30, 40, and then right up to 200. <laughs> Pretty neat. And then, then the plate, the dial, if you like, the, the number plate behind the arrow comes all the way back to zero. Kind of different, huh? They were, uh, they were actually used by Mike Nelson and Sea Hunt. Make sure you watch my Sea Hunt playlist. Okay, so, so we, have, we finally got depth gauges, and, and they were really good, and people accepted them. I want to show you this one. This one is pretty neat here. This is made by Taylor. Taylor. Taylor depth gauges, Taylor Instruments, and if you know anything about if you know anything about marine uh, maritime, you know the Taylor Instruments is still in business today. This is sixty years old. They're still in business. They still make quality marine instruments, compasses, and other gauges as well. They're still located, and I think they're still in Rochester, New York. And uh, and uh, this is this is one of their gauges from way back. This, in fact, was a gauge that I had when I started diving. And you can see here that it's a depth gauge. There's what the depth gauge looks like from Taylor. Just stay right there, Kevin. Put that down. Here's what the compass looks like from Taylor. Okay. And if you had the money, you could buy your depth gauge and compass combined. Okay. One less gauge in your arm. You got to remember, <laughs> we were kids, young. Our arms weren't too long. So by the time you got the depth gauge, then you got the compass on there, then you got the watch on there, <laughs> you're running out of arm. So this was a neat idea. It, was, it wasn't a great idea, but it was a neat idea. Uh, unfortunately, it made it difficult to read the depth gauge. But anyway, there's a, a depth gauge from Taylor, and that is the one that I used when I was a kid. Okay, what else have I got here? Depth gauges, depth gauges, no, it's kind of weird. Now, let's take a look at compasses, because compasses also were a little bit strange in the very beginning. A compass is a compass. You say, well, yes, but they had to be pressure-proof and waterproof. And, of course, different companies were trying different things to make their compass stand out. You already saw Taylor's compass. Pretty straightforward, just a compass just like we have today. But there are other ones that were a little bit weird. Here's a very, very strange one. And uh, this is a, a, a ball filled with oil, and the compass dial floats in there. You can see it rotating there, and there's a line on it. And 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 you tied it on yourself somewhere, and it floated. It actually floated. So you could hold it up, and it would stabilize, you had to hold it very steady, it would float, stabilize, and work really, really well. I want to show you this one. This is this is quite weird. Uh, two different companies, uh, probably the same company made them, but they were marketed differently. And and I'll take this one out perhaps. This is a, <clears throat> this is an interesting compass because if you look at it from the top, you can't see anything. Can you get in there, Kev? You can't see anything, nothing there. But if if you look at it from the side, you'll see that actually there is actually a dial in there, a flat dial in there. But what they've done with a special lens is they now have projected that dial up onto a flat face. So while the compass dial is flat, you look directly at it and you see the dial moving. And you see how small it is, a little tiny thing stuck on your wrist. This is actually a very, very old, very common called the Triton compass. There were several compasses like that. This is another example of the same thing. Pretty neat. And then regular compasses. Uh, many of the companies had compasses. Decor, Ike Light, Skiver Pros again. Skiver Pro always made things a bit bigger, a little bit more, uh, more robust. This was Skiver Pro's compass in the old days. And then these older compasses did not have, like today we have the, the uh, side reader. You can look through them and see direct. With these compasses you had to hold them very steady. You had to move them, keep them level, or they wouldn't work. Uh, now, of course, compasses are much, much easier to use. Now, um, we didn't have really good watches. Well, there were good watches, but a good waterproof watch was expensive. Uh, uh, so, so what did divers do for timing? Well, it was a little bit tough in the old days. So what we would try to do is we would try to find a cheap watch. 
a, a good but cheap watch. I remember the Renault, the, the Renault uh, battery operator watch. There were no, no um, uh, quartz watches back then. No battery operator. They're all wind up watches. So what do you do? You got a wind up watch. It's not waterproof. I have to check the time. I got a good depth gauge. I need to know the time. Well, what you could do, you go into your dive store and you could buy one of these. You see? How much in there? What are you buying this for? Put a strap. Well, <laughs> you buy this because it's a very sturdy aluminum case with an O-ring and a face on it. Yeah, so, well, it's easy. Come on, use your imagination. All you have to do now is get a cheap watch. Now you got a watch. Well, are spending a lot of money. Just like that. And if you can't afford to buy one of those fancy dive watches, where well, you get your cheap Boy Scout watch, you take the case off, and you put the Boy Scout watch in. One of those cases. Like that. So it wasn't uncommon to see a diver with a couple of these cases on his arm, one for his watch, one for his compass, and then a capillary depth gauge, so he had a total investment of $25, all the instrumentation he needed. That was a lot of fun back then, it certainly was. Later, a uh, bottom timer, a, a true, the very first true automatic bottom timer did come out, a company called, I think it was called Princeton Tech, Princeton Tectonics, they're not around anymore, they make great lights, I don't think they are, maybe they are. And they made the first bottom timer, comes with a wrist strap like this, and this was automatic. So as you descended, it automatically measured your bottom timer. As soon as you started the descent, it measured your bottom, a bottom timer, automatic bottom timer. These were very, very popular, and they were replaced pretty quickly. Some other weird ones, how about this? This is a neat little wrist thermometer. If you look carefully here, this is quite fragile. Little wrist thermometer. Yeah, there you go, you wanna know what the water temperature is? This is actually a thermometer, but it's designed and modified so it can be taken underwater, worn on somebody's wrist. It's like that. And then one more I'll show you as well. That's this one, which is from Voigt. Big, big diving company. Brand spanking new in the box. I don't really know for sure how that happens, but this was a very popular, very well-made, solid brass, heavy, heavy rubber strap, uh, depth gauge. Again, with that built-in compass. See the compass needle on top there? Can you see it moving there? Yeah. This is very, very well made, all brass. And it has that magnifying lens. There were quite a few like that. The, the top face wasn't flat. It was a magnifier. So when you looked at this underwater, it looked like it was about six inches big. Even, even me with my bad eyes uh, looking close up, I could see it really, really well. So there you go, folks. There is uh, uh, some, some vintage gauges. Here's a couple of vintage gauges. U.S. divers, a compass with a capillary depth gauge and a, and a needle or analog depth gauge with a capillary depth gauge on it. Brand new in the boxes from U.S. divers. So what I'll do is, I hope uh, some interest there, some of the weird stuff. And what I'll do in the future is I'll pick certain gauges that are special. Special. I'll talk about them, how much they cost, what they're worth, where you can get them, if you can't get them today, how well they work, and all that kind of, maybe some funny things about them. Because I have, a lot of these gauges, I have stories about them, the ones used on Sea Hunt, my own watch, and things like that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Vintage gauges, scuba gauges, vintage scuba gauges, from Alec Pierce, vintage scuba. Huh, that's cool. Talk to you soon. Keep those comments coming. I love them. Bye-bye.